Mike and Mitch. And I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight and welcome you all. We just got some great appetizers here by Tree, so feel free to help yourselves as we're doing our introductions and introducing Mitch to tonight. Um, I, we're here from Green Leaders, and I'd like to tell you all just a little bit about Green Leaders. This year we're focusing on back to nature. Green Leaders started about a year and a half ago with 12 of us. Actually, some of you I see here tonight, um, David Bergman, who's out there somewhere. And the idea was... <laughs> The idea was to bring together a cross-section of different people in the New York community that are focused on green and really are thought leaders within green and wanting to make a difference on it and bring us together so that we can exchange ideas and make connections across the New York City community. It's growing now tonight to where we see people from the Nature Conservancy, Ecosystems, uh, Sun One Solutions, Sea to Table, all these different types of green companies and organizations that are here tonight in an intimate setting where we have a chance to meet with each other, learn about what's going on across the green community, and also have a chance to hear from thought leaders. Um, we've had a chance in the past to hear from Tansi Whalen of the Rainforest Alliance, Paul Mankiewicz from the Gaia Institute, and tonight we'll have a chance to hear from Mitchell Yoka from Terra Farm. Um, so right now I'd like to turn it over to Marissa, one of our other founders of Green Leaders. Hi everyone. First I'd like to thank Tree, our host tonight. Um, Tree seemed like a perfect sort of nature-inspired venue, and when I asked the owner, Colm, how, how we thought of the name Tree, he said, well, I happen to be an Irishman who couldn't say one, two, three. So um, the name actually sort of inspired the place, and there happens to be three trees back here and the only one on the block in front of Tree. So thank you so much for being such a great host and uh, giving us these kind appetizers here tonight. Yes, thank you. So um, before I continue on and introduce Mitchell, i just like to say that part of what we'd like to do going forward is to not only showcase our speakers, but also showcase what you are doing yourself. So um, come the next Green Leaders event, what we'll be doing is circulating an email saying what's going on. We're going to feature a few of you, each Green Leaders event that we have, so you can get a couple minutes to share what you're doing with everybody as well. Um, so I'd like to introduce Mitchell now, who is a partner of Terraform One and faculty of Columbia University. Um, I first met Mitchell at um, 33 Flatbush. Over the internet. Over the internet. <laughs> yeah. All right. Apparently, <laughs> apparently we met, you know, on some online dating website or, or whatnot. Um, but uh, I first met Mitchell, and um, he said, "I make houses out of meat." And I said, "What?" I said, "You mean like sustainable building?" And he said, "I hate the word sustainable. Sustainable is not enough. You have to be doing something to give back." And uh, and actually, that's what he was quoted saying in um, the most recent feature in Wired magazine, which is why he is the, one of the next people that you should listen to and the next president should listen to. So um, let's hear it for Mitchell Yoakum. And um, we'll be out of here by 8.30, I assure you, so you can go home and watch the debate. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you to Tree and Green Leaders and Green Spaces, uh, Jenny, etc. Uh, yeah, they said this would be a kind of informal, I think she was right, talking about sustainability and being extremely suspicious of this idea of uh, green, or actually sustainability, because we've been saying it for some time. You know, I think if you look back to the literature in the you know, 60s, uh, 70s, etc., you can find exactly what you need to say. It's completely relevant today, and just change names from you know, president back then or Vietnam War to Bush and Iraq, and still the same subject. And back then they were using terms like now or immediately, the sky is falling, we're all going to die, we must do something quick. Uh, what happened? So here we are 40 years later, and there's a new generation, and the revolution, the green revolution, is over with, essentially, right? It's become uh, mainstream. So it's a matter of reifying these concepts that we've been talking about for decades, focusing in, getting very critical. So I. We at Terraform take the standpoint not to believe everything you hear. Uh, sustainability as a term uh, is not very evocative, right? I don't think you would want, uh, you know, a sports hero to be sustainable, right? You want this guy to evolve and to change and to, you know, be this powerful figure that you're looking for. You certainly wouldn't want a sustainable sports guy in your team, right? Or, or in a sustainable marriage. So, you know, we need to be much, much more provocative. The word sustainable has this inherently in and of itself. Um, I think we like the term uh, ecology. 
uh, we're, we're essentially architects and urban designers, so ecology as a principle is easier to operate on. There's so many subsets of that field that you can specifically take a solution and, 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 and use, that, that, okay, Scott, use that particular concept to help mitigate uh, the, a solution. You know, road ecology, industrial ecology, of, you know, uh, social ecology, all these things are, are, are much more exciting than the blanket term sustainability. If you ask 10 scientists what sustainability means, you'll get 10 answers, right? So I think uh, if you ask what a road ecologist does, he or she will be very specific of the effects of the landscape and patchworks and, and, and patch dynamics and genetics on population species with, uh, with in relationship to a road. So uh, I think it makes a little more sense. Um, so on that note, saying being critical is the overall theme, which, you know, I don't know, maybe that's slightly glib, uh, fine. Uh, but it's okay to be glib. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example uh, of failing to understand what, what sustainability does and the message that we send out. So if we're green leaders, we're supposed to tell people what's sustainable, sorry, what's ecological, screw sustainability, and what's not. So there's this great life cycle analysis study done by uh, our friends at Dow Chemical, and they're very interested in, in telling parents what the best diaper is for your child. So. The difference, the choices were, if you're at the store, uh, a plastic diaper or a cloth diaper. So if you're a parent and you're about to change your toddler uh, and you want to do something good for the environment, which diaper would you use? Does anyone have a clue? Just take a guess. What diaper would you use? Cloth. Cloth diaper. Anyone want to say plastic? Plastic. Okay, pla plastic. Plastic. Okay. okay, so plastic. Well, so they had a team of scientists using uh, Athena and uh, some other uh, programs to do a full life cycle report and compare the two diapers. Now, it's paid for by a company that's inherently interested in plastic, so, you know, might have been biased, but it was a peer-reviewed document that was quite <coughs> neutral and said without a shadow of a doubt, plastic diapers are good for the environment. In fact, they're the best for the environment. All things considered, transportation, energy use, and their creation, cradle to cradle thinking or cradle to grave. It's better to throw these things in a landfill than to use cloth diapers. So this is the, the semiotic pulse that they've sent to the American populace. Right? This is our good scientists and our leaders listening to our good scientists. Uh, the result was this, uh, you know, 500-page study, something like that. Not being exactly accurate. That proved it. So after a couple of years. Some other smart people took a look at this study. Why? Because they're critical. They don't believe it. I mean, fine. I, I, I don't, this is not something that's so obvious, but they reviewed it. And what they saw is that somewhere in the equations, uh, and I won't talk about diapers the whole night, but that if, you draw, <laughs> that, if you, that if you use an electric dryer, right, with a cloth diaper, it uses a tremendous amount of energy and shifts that equation wasting a lot of fuel, more carbon loading in the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. So if you, use a, if you take that out and you decide to dry your diaper in the wind, right, now radically changes that entire equation, a new paradigm, and you have uh, the notion that cloth diapers are great for kids. So <coughs> the first answer was, was correct. But unfortunately, the message and the signal was wrong. And I think that's what I'd like to be uh, cautious about. I guess the cautionary principles, not just send out messages that are wrong, but send out the message that everyone from leaders to scientists to Homer Simpson have to question what we're saying is green or not. And I think that kind of a dialogue brings out you know, the medical, the scientific mind, but also the average consumer can kind of think twice before they do it. And the consumers are smart people, kind of establish what we purchase and, and, and uh, you know, what runs the economy. Uh, another concrete example. Uh, I'll talk about razors, right? Uh, I, I know I'm an architect and I do a lot of discussion about buildings, but that might not appeal to everyone here, so I think you can relate to uh, a razor. Uh, I didn't shave today, but normally I shave. I use this great razor called a Gillette Mach 5 razor. The thing is fantastic. It's quadruply <laughs> packaged. It's got shiny silver die-cast parts mixed in with plastic parts, mixed in with impossible to recycle parts, and parts that contain VOCs and you know carcinogens with the possibility of course the thing is a poison for the environment but it looks fabulous and it performs fabulous so when I'm going out on a date or if I have an important engagement this is important but you know doing something where I need to shave I'm going to not use 
right? Dr. J is not going to use the Eco Blade that's going to scrape the shit out of my face, but I'm going to use this <laughs> Gillette Mach 5 thing. And I'm going to make sure it does the job, the performance, the design performance that I expect, right? So as designers or thinkers or leaders, we need to do something just like the Gillette Mach 5 razor, or for ladies, there's the Venus version for your legs, right? We need to produce the same kind of quality, the same kind of fabulousness, the same kind of thing that will sell just as well, that be demanded from the ghettos to Wall Street, everyone wants this razor, but happens to be good for the environment, happens to be green, subsumed underneath the making of this product or the design of the product, the signal of our, our, of, of our intentions is to fit it into our green metabolism. And it'll still, and, and try and make it cheaper. So that the thing, if you had a choice between the Gillette Mach 5 and, I don't know, you know, the green version of it, you'll purchase the green one. Not because it's a green thing, but because it's just a better razor. So uh, being suspicious and going with the flow is a, a, another thing that we often do. It's very hard to get clients in architecture to do what we want to do when it comes to green design. Uh, it, I don't know if you've ever tried getting a client to accept putting in bamboo floors, right? They're kind of nice, uh, <laughs> but it's a bamboo floor. It might cost three times as much. It has less than five years of testing. We can't guarantee the thing's not going to scratch. We have no history of what they really do. Uh, they're manufactured in a process that's not as well to uh, understand or comprehend or install. Not too many contractors are familiar with it. It's a, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's a stretch. And it's a freaking bamboo floor. I mean, come on, it's not rocket science. But this is something that we find very hard to do. So that bamboo floor has got to perform better than the crap that we put in anyway, the PVC or the linoleum or something else. And that, I think, will convince people to, to go and purchase these products and use them without having too much doubt, without feeling you know, reticent about making this change. It's better for the environment. In fact, not even telling them that it's green or good for the environment. Just tell them it looks fabulous, right? It's sexy, it's bamboo, and that you really want it. And I, not to be subversive, but they're, I think they're, or, or certainly not to trick them into purchasing it, but this is the challenge as leaders and as designers and thinkers that we're faced with. So it's, it's not so simple. Uh, recently, I was in Washington, D.C. giving a similar talk. Uh, this is to the New American Foundation, a progressive political think tank, on what the next president, whoever uh, he might be, uh, should be thinking about when it comes to, well, what can happen with the green economy. Uh, so I was there to kind of give some uh, advice on what I thought would make sense for uh, being green. And it really depends on the guy you're talking to. Uh, one, I'm, I'm I don't know if I should say this on camera. I'm not really a Republican or a Democrat. I don't care so much for either party, I mean, more or less. So, but I, I can understand individuals. And I think McCain would want a very different answer from me than Obama, right? I think one would be preaching to the choir and the other one would be a slight uphill battle. So I had two answers for these guys. Um, you can guess who was who. But uh, the first thought was that we should have a carbon-free military that we should invest all, all of our R&D in warfare in making these vehicles run uh, good for the environment, right? That they would be uh, hydrogen-based or electric uh, fuel cell-based vehicles. Why do that? Well, not because it's good for the environment, because the military, I don't think, cares, but because there's advantages as a military to not being dependent on oil, to running silent, right? That, you know, military folks like stealthy vehicles to have vehicles that have distributed power so that if you knock out one particular component of these big scary war machines which will never go away despite 50 years of green thinking uh, the thing will still run or unitized volumes right of distributed power so that if your tank gets hit you can take components out and power your Hummer take those components out and power some other nasty device. Either way, it's getting the military to solve a lot of our infrastructural problems and our problems with uh, fuel cells that the car industry isn't doing so well, uh, and a couple of other reasons. So I'm, I'm sure that we could use that money to change how we think about our, our mobility in our economy. Uh, the other solution that I had was um, thinking about uh, a, new, a new system of mobility for, the, for New York City, but changing uh, the constituency of mobility. So the second answer was power companies 
I think would be great taking over the American automotive industry. Uh, uh, I think that they're certainly fit out to build not only the infrastructure, but the drivetrains to run these particular vehicles. Uh, I happen to know that they're very interested in doing something like that. So what they would be doing is setting up an electrical grid with dynamically loaded battery systems distributed throughout city cores that would take in peak demands or recharge areas or produce micro-generation of electricity because these things are on wheels. They would essentially produce these engines that have no moving parts, right, which has already been developed. Fuel cell is no moving parts. Back to the military, that's another thing the military likes is engines with no moving parts, easy to switch out or repair. So if we get our infrastructure built out by our power companies, and they're also building out these mobile battery devices that could move throughout a grid, give the automakers a task, which is to build carriages and chassis and components and ergonomic interiors of, you know, whatever, some sexy profiling something. You know, let them do what they've been doing for the last 50 years, just, you know, the same wrapped gift in a slightly different color. And they would just get out of the engine-making business. Uh, and you would combine those two forces, and you'd have a whole different way of looking at uh, America when it comes to mobility. Um, please don't, if you'd like to, steal those ideas. If they're certainly welcome to. If there's anyone here that's in the power company, uh, Con Edison is someone. It's one of our clients, so we're, you know, we'd love to meet you afterwards. <laughs> uh, and we are working on something similar for this right now. Um, so I don't know how many new ideas you'd like to hear. Uh, I think I only have 10 minutes, but uh, please find us either in the building or look at terraform.org. That's T-E-R-R-E -R -R -E for reform, F-O-R-M, uh, .org. And, you know, we're a, a nonprofit 501c3 company, so, you know, our doors are always open. Uh, we don't get taxed by the IRS, so we have to meet people and do community outreach <laughs> and help you. So, uh, uh, one current thing we're doing is a counter plan for Columbia University's expansion. So uh, I think the people of Harlem aren't necessarily getting a fair shake with some very sexy and powerful planners and architects like Renzo Piano producing their new master plan up there on 135th Street or so. Uh, we're producing a counter plan for free and for the community. Partly for selfish reasons, to be honest, we just want to have fun doing doing this. We like putting the funk in functionalism and doing things very green. But uh, another reason is to you know create this outreach. So it's a, another project that's on the boards. And I'd be happy to show you anything that we're doing. Yes, we have a house of meat. We are, we've uh, constructed 90% uh, molecular cell biology lab. Uh, Dr. Oliver Medvedic, the guy I went to Harvard with, we were roommates, we've known each other for eight years, uh, is teaching at Harvard, but he's uh, very interested in, in uh, well, in gene targeting techniques. But we came together to work on uh, making objects using um, regenerative medicine into specific forms that are living and grown, and they're organic. So it's not architecture or design that's organic as a metaphor, but it is organic. It is alive. Uh, it, but it dies rather quickly because it has no immunological system and no vascular system and other things, and we let it die, but that's okay. At least it was produced in, a, in an in vitro process, in a victimless process, where no sentient creature was hurt. We're just using cells and replicating them and building scaffolds into a specific geometry so we can make products that are green. Our goal is to make 100% you know, organic housing, and we've done this with the tree house, uh, the fab tree house, now we want to do it with the meat house. So we have our vegetable architecture, now we've got our kind of our, our meat architecture. Starch will be next. Do you guys live in that house? Is there what? Do you guys live in that house? Vegans are welcome. The, the challenge actually came on the cover of the New York Times, PETA set up, we'll give you a million bucks if you can figure out how to consume, or figure out a consumption system for in vitro meat products. And I thought, great, I don't want people necessarily, necessarily to eat the stuff. But I thought consumption could be in the form of dwelling or, or living or inhabiting, or inhabiting a space. So as architects, we'll go for the million bucks by showing them that, you know, you can live in it. And there you go. And it might be more appropriate to live in it. It's probably tough to get the stuff palatable within, you know, five years. <laughs> anyway, so find me either on the internet or right here in person. Yeah. God forbid. And, uh, mm -hmm. and thanks to, uh, well, all the green leaders for, for uh, having me. Thank, Thank you, you, Mitch. That's great.
lot of cooking on a whole different level, which Mitch does in terms of looking at no pun intended. ecology, um, in terms of going into the elections, but I feel like you take it to a whole different different level here. And I think Mitch will be here for a little while if you guys have some questions, or feel free sometime to stop by the Mets, and we're happy to show you around. Yeah, so. Mex is a, a fantastic synergetic environment where there's all sorts of people working on uh, green green solutions. So it's a there's space available actually if you want to move in that's pretty cheap. But, uh, it's it's a it's an environment where people just like yourselves would find a, a wonderful home to do things like we're all doing yeah. and, and meet others on a daily basis and create that necessary synergy to get these things done and to be critical amongst each other. Know, say what's good or not. So great. Well, thank you much. Yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot.